again uh, welcome to another stream the grandmaster's choice and today we'll actually be going through a very special game of mine that I played in 2017 in the second round of European individual where I actually got my second grandmaster norm in that tournament and this game was sort of like the the turning point for me to really understand what it means to be a grandmaster and how grandmasters think, um, how they play, and potentially even prepare. So we're going to be going through just one game today, um, and that's going to be quite a long one, I would say. Um, and it's going to have a lot of ups and downs. So let's get started. Um, I'm playing with the black pieces against Grandmaster Alexander Mista uh, from Poland. And the game started off with a very standard opening, the, the Rey Lopez. And at that time, I basically played a little bit of everything, maybe uh, the main lines more than, off, more than others. But in that game, I actually was preparing against my opponent and kind of saw something I could play that I thought was worth interesting to play. We got plenty of tactics and everything you're going to see because I was an international master when I played this game. And after this game, I basically understood a little bit more about um, a little bit more about uh, grandmasters. So, and here I played this move f5. And in a classical game, usually you don't see this too often, especially. I mean, you do see it compared to other other lines of the Ruy Lopez. You don't see it as much. Um, so I played f5 and the reason I played that is because my opponent pretty much played more or less the same line against it although my sample size was quite small but anyways I prepared this line f5 and I played this line with knight f6 which is a little bit more on the solid side rather than the risky d5 line um, that is quite dangerous probably objectively not so good so my opponent took and he played queen e2 and as far as I remember, this was exactly what he was playing in the database as well. And of course, I was prepared. So I played bishop e7, takes, takes, and knight takes e5. So black uh, voluntarily gives up this pawn in the center in order to get the pair of bishops and some sort of an activity. Um, I played queen e6, which is one of the, the main moves. Of, obviously, if white castles, black simply plays the move d6. And they will be winning a piece because of the pin. So knight f3 was played. And after takes takes, I played the move c5. So all of this is basically theory. It has been played before. Um, nothing new so far. But the idea is that black wants to go bishop b7. And then attack the knight on f3. Put pressure on this diagonal. Maybe castle. Bring the other rook if they can. There's quite some initiative happening. So here my opponent played rook e1. Bishop b7. King f1. And important move, bishop takes f3, getting rid of this knight. G takes f3, and I played rook f8. So it was all still theory for me, but it wasn't uh, as much theory for my opponent. So here he played the move rook e3, but I want to kind of emphasize that this is all still preparation. But most importantly, there is actually a move called, or like d4, with the idea to sacrifice a pawn, but after black takes, uh, white can simply play this move, bishop g5, attacking this um, bishop on e7, where black has to respond with rook f7, and black, white can respond with something like rook e4, with the idea to attack the pawn on d4, but actually they are threatening rook to um, e1, and after black responds with d5, White goes rook e5, black goes rook d8, white goes rook e1, rook d7, and even after some line like this and some mass trades, we get a pawn end game that is pretty drawish after this, this, and I don't want to go too much in detail, but you can take my word 
for it after this 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 is all preparation and this would just somehow lead to a draw at the end of the day so this is kind of why the title has how to prep uh, think and play like a grandmaster the first part the first phase is I had basically analyzed every single line within this line if my opponent played d4 and I had all my um, variations ready to be able to make a simple draw after just knowing a lot of theory so of course when I say simple it's not always going to be very easy to make a draw but this is a very important thing when you're preparing to cover your bases well otherwise you will be in a tough spot when you're playing against the 2600 Grandmaster so my opponent did not play that he played um, the move rook e3 um, just defending the pawn I played simply d6 b3 and then king went to d7 just kind of getting out of the pin on the e-file and after bishop b2 I played bishop g5 uh, attacking the rook on e3 and here my opponent played rook d3 and in this moment I actually would like to ask the the chat uh, what would you play if you were playing with the black pieces here as I believe my next move was an inaccuracy from my side and it was quite a tough moment for me to understand um, I mean I understood it maybe a little later but it wasn't so easy to kind of figure out why this was a mistake during the game although now it actually makes a lot more sense um, because I don't think I would ever make such a move if I were to play with black again but uh, in this position there are multiple good moves rook f7 is an option for sure there is the option of playing g6 and there is also the option of playing this move bishop to f6 which is with the idea to trade the bishops and then get some activity on the f file so i see quite a lot of rook f7 being suggested and i also see the move bishop f6 being suggested so i would say that um, rook f7 or g6 would have been the right choice um, and unfortunately i played this move bishop f6 the reason I say it's unfortunate because simply after rook f7 or g6 this bishop will be useless forever whereas my bishop can actually be more on the useful side so I could have easily played a move like rook f7 and then doubled up and then played g6 and then did something else with this bishop on g5 and um, this would actually make a lot more sense but I played bishop f6 and the reason this is a mistake is not because trading the bishops and so on it's a little bit more deeper than that it's more uh, about what happened maybe f in the next four or five moves maybe like more like five seven moves you know five to seven moves so he took I took and here I was like okay this game is basically headed to a draw because I'm gonna go rook f8 and there is no way this game is gonna last lo longer than I think maybe like maybe like one hour in total because I had all the time in the world I was blitzing out everything my opponent still had quite a lot of time since he knew a lot of this position anyways uh, except for the move d4 but that would not have led to anything special for white so here I played rook f8 and in this position the expectation I had was my opponent will never ever play rook to e3 because it's super passive and I mean even if they do it's very difficult for them to make progress so my expectation was on the along the lines king g2 rook g6 king goes anywhere and basically I attack the pawn and this will end in a repetition but of course this is not what happened I completely overlooked my opponent's opportunity on the next move so it's very important task in hand to go for this position it's why to play so of course if I say that uh, the game ended with king g2 rook g6 king h1 in repetition we definitely would not be having this lecture because this would just be a very short draw but it this game is actually much more complicated than uh, a short draw so I played the uh, rook f8 and here my opponent played a move that I was really not expecting um, at that moment it took me a while to understand it but my brain started working like the uh, like my opponent and like other grandmasters basically throughout the tournament after this game and then I eventually got my norm 
Um, so even if you go king e2, yeah, it's possible to go king e2. But I can go rook h6, put pressure on the h-pawn, and if you defend your h-pawn, I can always even put the rook on h3, be super annoying about it. And uh, at the end of the day, this should still be a um, quite easy draw for, for me. So, so another suggestion is rook e4, and this is, a, this is a very, very tricky move, actually, because that's what my opponent did. So rook e4. But what's the idea, right? In the game, I was thinking, okay, rook e4 is kind of smart, but it gives up this pawn. But he also just wants to go for my a7 pawn. So what I did, I basically took, they took, and then I took again. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so we have another important position um, in hand. So of course, we have to consider and calculate rook a4, and this is very important because rook n games kind of um, yeah, important. Yeah, you're right with rook e4, but we kind of, of course, have to have to understand what's the idea behind behind rook e4, right? So, what can white? What should white do next, or what is the idea of both sides? This is, in my opinion, uh, a very important important moment that we should take some time and just try to figure out what is happening. So it is um, white to play here. King g2 now is one suggestion. Rook a4 is definitely a suggestion that I am suggesting. What else? It's very, very important to understand what is happening here and this is the thing is when I of course mention it it's kind of easy to look for a nuance but in a real game you kind of don't look for a nuance and the tough part is bishop f6 is actually wrong because of what is about to happen so the moment I told you bishop f6 is not a good move is because what is about to happen in the game otherwise bishop f6 is perfectly natural a good move um, although you're trading the bishops and so on, the activity part of it is satisfactory, so you're not really trading. But rook e4 takes, takes, takes. This moment is extremely, extremely important to understand. And this is actually how GMs usually spend their time during a game and calculate. Um, I still had quite a lot of time here, as far as I remember, because I was still playing fast. And I always like to play fast anyways, so I, I really enjoyed uh, doing that quite a lot, and I still do. Um, yeah, King g2 is possible, but I'm not sure. I don't want to give anything away just yet. Well, if you go h4, then I'm probably not too concerned, I would say. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm too concerned because your pawn on h4 will be super weak. Um, and even if you go rook there and there, I will always be able to collect your pawn as well. So that doesn't really scare me um, just yet. Um, White has the open file, but does not seem like much. Yeah, the open file alone doesn't make too much in this sense because the the king is defending every entry square. So that's not really the the issue for for black. Can we play d4? I mean, even if you play d4, I think you are allowing ideas like rook c3 now all of a sudden that were not there before. So d4 would actually help um, help black quite a bit. Yeah, so let's, let's analyze what would happen if I go rook a4, right? So why is this not the correct move? Or maybe it's the correct move. It's attacking the pawn on a7 and you just want to push the pawn down the board. And this is the most natural move. My opponent just played rook e4. 
So if the move rook a4 is not going to be analyzed, then it's pointless. And that has to be the first thing you analyze. But after rook a4, here I would play this move rook h3. And it's very important because if you take my pawn, I take your pawn and I get quite some counterplay here. I get my rook behind the pawn and um, I should be able to create enough counterplay and I have a pass pawn myself. So this should not be any trouble for me um, in this position. However, after rook h3, my opponent is very likely that they will play this move king to g2. They will attack my rook. And here in this situation, I can actually play a um, couple of moves, but I would probably play something like rook h5 or rook h6 with the idea that if you take my rook, I give you a check. And now you can go to four different locations and whichever file you choose to go to, I will be going to the other file. So if you play king h3 or something, I will be going rook f6. If you go back, I will give you a check. If you go here, I will go, I can check you too, but I can also just go there. If you go to g3, I will still check you. So you cannot get out of this loop, basically. And that will be a draw without giving up either of your pawns. So that's why my opponent decided not to do rook to a4, because this is quite an annoying thing to deal with. So here, as it was correctly pointed out in the chat, my opponent played this move rook h4 with the idea to attack this pawn on h7. So he's first inducing me to play this move h6, which I don't have a choice. And here is a very important moment because black, sorry, white has a choice. They can obviously play the same rook a4 with the idea to attack the pawn. But there is this kind of like rook h3 kind of ideas like we just saw. And I can do the same thing from here basically without with the pawn on h6, but also they have this move rook g4. And what is the difference between the two, right? Well, if you go rook g4 first, which probably was the right move, and he didn't play it, um, I, I would have to respond with either the move g5 or my rook dropping back to f7 so that I can keep this motif alive on the fifth rank. So let's see the difference. If I play g5 here, now I no longer have this concept of rook dropping down in this situation. So I cannot do any of the things I have just mentioned long, some time ago. I have to drop back here, basically, and I cannot do this check business anymore because I have my pawn on the way. And therefore, that doesn't make too much sense. Um, Practically speaking, I should maybe try to play something like this. And if you capture, play something like c4. Try to create some sort of an activity and hope for some rook endgame and try to defend. But it would just be as tough as defending any other rook endgame versus an experienced grandmaster. And if you take, maybe I kind of swing my rook and try to swing around and do something to win some pawns. This was some computer line. Maybe not the best line at this moment, but that would be the hope. However, I could also play this move uh, rook to f7 so that if my opponent plays rook a4, then I can play rook f5. And then if rook takes a7, rook h5, and we have seen this sort of an idea before, right? If king g2, rook goes there, king goes up, rook goes there. And we have seen this type of a method before if you go here, anywhere, it doesn't matter. I stick, check. If you go towards me, I go there. And this would be a draw. So rook f7 would be definitely uh, the move to play in this type of position. Um, but I would actually be forced to play rook f7. Rather than a choice, I don't really have a choice. I have to find the move, rook back to f7, and then play on from there. But here my opponent played rook a4, which is probably not as accurate as rook g4, but what's the difference? Like, how can you even tell why rook g4, rook a4 is not the most accurate in a game versus rook, um, sorry, why is rook g4, rook a4 is better versus rook a4 immediately? And what is the difference? Because it's not so obvious, at least to me, 
uh, and it was not obvious at all until a certain time. So, so what is the, the difference here? Um, Zoa says I would have gone king c6. You can definitely go king c6 at some point, but that means you're going to be giving up this pawn and you will be playing this position um, uh, for a while. However, it's better to maybe look for some counterplay immediately, like that or maybe like this. So, yeah, I guess question to the viewers is what's the difference? Why is rook g4, rook a4 such a big deal? I mean, it kind of gives it away at this point. Um, but it's, it's very, very important to understand the nuances and the differences between the two. So it's, a, it's kind of a challenge, I would say, during the game because no one tells you, oh, you have to first include rook g4 and then play the move rook a4 rather than rook a4 immediately because there's x, y, z. No one tells you that. So in an actual game, I think the best way to do that is calculate every single alternative and try to figure it out for yourself, which one you like better, or which one you don't like. So, as I mentioned, rook g4 would have been better, um, but here I played this move rook to, um, rook to f5, which I think is a dubious move. Although, it's the idea, uh, it's the idea we just talked about, it, it would have been forced, I would have been forced to play rook f5 had my opponent chosen to play rook g4, rook a4. So he could have forced me to play rook f5, which is pretty much the only logical move in this situation to do this. But in this scenario, I am not forced to play rook f5. I actually have <coughs> the option of playing rook to h3, attacking the pawn. But I was worried about one thing, and actually this is the thing that he thought is, uh, is good for him. That's why he played it because he was going to go king g2 and I was going to go rook h5 and only in this moment instead of taking here because then we have the drawing mechanism his idea was to play this move rook to g4 and I was practically speaking very afraid of this because um, I really didn't want to play the move g5 here because after I played the move g5 I think I was um, a little scared that this rook will never ever be able to make it to the game. As far as I remember, computers still think that this position is holdable, but it still looked a little bit scary to me. And I'm looking at the Lee Chess engine, it's giving around 1.5. If I remember correctly, it's around that line, around the lines of 1.5, maybe a little less um, after g5. But then, if I don't go g5, I sort of have to play this move rook g5. And to my eyes, this was very difficult to evaluate when I compared it with the move rook f5 instead of rook h3. So I saw this position and I wasn't sure about the pawn end game, and therefore I decided to not play this, um, um, this position. So, um, yeah. So... This is not what I did, um, and therefore I played this move, rook to f5. So again, it's a, again it's a critical moment, I would say, not here, but after rook h5. So he took my pawn, I played rook to h5. Um, the difference with the pawn on h6, you could play g6. I mean, yes, that's true, but also... Um, yeah, sort of provoking h6 also was important, and then, the, yeah, so that's a good observation. I have problems in cleanly converting winning positions. What would you suggest? Um, I think you just have to play out a lot of winning positions, and you just have to improve your tactics. That's, that's all. Um, and then positional chess. So you have to basically improve in all areas to be able to improve winning cleanly winning positions. So anyways, I played rook h5, and this is once again um, white to play. What would you play with white here? So we will have to accelerate at some point because this game is quite long, actually. Um, the rook end game is the fun part, but also you're going to be surprised on how, how this game is going to be so continuing. And that's kind of the reason I always say this is the game that made me a GM because... We essentially had the opening preparation phase and then we had an end game with two rooks versus two rooks. Now we're having a clean rook end game um, and I guess we're going to see what's going to be coming up soon. 
So here anyways, I don't want to spend too much time. My opponent played this move extremely strong, rook a4. Rook a4 with the idea, I guess we're going to be understanding that very soon. I took on h2, obviously that was my idea. And here, um, black, sorry, white has a choice, right? White again, once again has a choice. Um, it can be the move king g1 and it can also be the move rook g4. So those are the main choices that white has. And I'm of course kind of helping out in this situation because if I don't say white has a choice, and if I don't mention the choices, there might be other potential candidate moves. But to just make things e easier, uh, we're just going to be talking about these two moves. So here, uh, one move is correct and one move is wrong. But it's really, once again, very, very tough to evaluate. Um, when it comes to evaluating this position, I think one has to be sort of... <coughs> really curious about this position because both of the moves they kind of look the same i would say because at the end of the day white usually is thinking they're almost winning here because they have a very nice outside passed pawn that is a big distraction and this passed pawn is not really uh, doing too much so let's let's kind of think about it so rook g4 is a candidate move and then there is king g1 um, so let's kind of start with a little bit both. So, and the chat is saying rook g4. So rook g4 actually was the move played in the game. So let's kind of talk about the other one and then um, talk about rook g4. And now there is a suggestion of king g1 because it prevents the check. So why is this check important or is it important? We will have to discuss that. But if king g1 was played, I don't have a choice other than playing the rook to h5 because if I go rook h3, you can always uh, push my rook to h5 anyways. So I might as well just go rook h5 in the first place. And after rook goes to h5, let's say white swings the rook to g4, they're attacking the pawn. The last thing I probably want to do is this move g5. It looks super scary. As far as I remember, the computer still holds this. Yeah, the position is around 0 0.6. So the computer can hold this. But while my opponent has an outside passed pawn, I really do not want to lock my rook in. It's practically speaking very difficult for me to defend this position. So I would have probably played something along the lines king c6 takes and then maybe something like c4 just to get some sort of activity on the fifth rank and try to claim that I can hold this end game somehow. But it would be a very tough choice. Or maybe I would have opted for a g5, who knows? but it would have been certainly a tough choice. Um, so this would basically be pretty much uh, forced play and who knows if I could defend this or not. So, but my opponent played the rook g, rook g4 move, which actually comes with a difference. His idea, however, was he wanted me to play g5 by force because after g5 is played, then my opponent can play something like this. And I would not have a choice to think about playing something like c4 and rook a5. But the trade-off to rook g4 is that it allows this check. And here probably my opponent was thinking the pawn end game is a win, which probably it looks winning. I, I mean, I'm not going to say if it's a win or a draw because um, although the game is one and a half, it doesn't mean if the pawn end game was a win or a draw. Anything could have happened. Um, and he played this move rook g1, takes, takes. So we reached... Uh, after all, we reached a pawn endgame. Um, there are many possible moves in this position, but we sort of have to understand what the winning idea for my opponent is, and then maybe try to figure out how I can um, defend against it. So I will not go in extreme detail of every single line of a pawn endgame because a pawn in game like this will take a long time to analyze and there is quite a lot of nuances. But generally speaking, the idea is conceptually very easy. And when you look at this position, you're like, oh, this pawn in game must be winning because there is a huge outside passed pawn that I have to deal with, with my king. Although I also have outside passed pawns, you have this f pawn that can be used as a basically splitting up my pawns into two uh, to collect all these pawns. So. White's idea is quite straightforward. He wants to basically get some sort of a structure like this, d3, c4, b3, a4, where all the pawns are untouchable, and then just somehow bring his king in the middle of my two pawns. 
even if he cannot bring it in the middle, he can at least approach them and then use the F pawn to sort of break the two pawns, whether it's the pawn is on G6, on G5, it doesn't matter. So he will be targeting this pawn with that pawn and as soon as he does that, he will be collecting two of the pawns and winning a pawn four versus three in the queen side. And that's kind of very straightforward when you think about it. I mean, if black does nothing, white is just gonna do that. White is just gonna walk his king, push this pawn up the board. When I take, he's gonna take either thing and then go back to the other one since I don't have any activity. So it looks completely winning, hence my opponent played rook g4. And I cannot uh, disagree with that because it looks completely lost for me. But here I figured out his idea was to go c4. So I was like, I'm not going to let you. I play this move d5. Um, how did either player know how to evaluate this? Well, we were kind of evaluating by calculating and kind of figuring out ideas here and there. Um, but c4 and other pawns, c4, you can control the two pawns on a and b and create another pass pawn. So, okay, first of all, I started with d5. I didn't quite understand what you were saying, so I guess we'll talk about it. But it's very difficult for me to create a passed pawn, by the way, because I cannot create one when I have doubled pawns. My opponent is not forced to take anything I give them. And uh, even if I take them, um, it's just very difficult to like force um, a passed pawn. Like he has four of them. I have three of them, but like it basically looks like two. I played d5 and my opponent played c3 here. Well, what's the idea of c3? Um, I would say idea of c3 is quite simple. He wants to go d3 and then c4. Why not d3 immediately? I think it was still possible, but in this position, if I remember correctly, I can just simply play like c4 and try to already separate the pawns uh, into two, or into multiple pieces that I can kind of deal with. So I would take, he would take, and even if he tried to do something, I would basically get the situation that he has here and I would or just to show it right let's say he does something like a4 um, a4 I take they take I just bring my king and then let's say they also do the same thing right let's say they run I run they run right and then here I would go c5 same idea as he would apply uh, he would go f4 and I would go something like this split up my pawns I would split up your pawns and we would have a very nice grandmaster draw at the end. This would be brilliant. But here my opponent did not want to go for any of that. He played the move c3. The point being, if I go c4 and I want to trade some things, he is going to go b4, a4. There is no way I can force any trades now. Even if I get this pawn to c5, let's say I go here, there, and then there, he's just going to start bringing his king. If I go c5, he couldn't care less. He would just go there. And now I, my king is useless. I can't go and grab. Even if I go d4, he's never going to take it. He's just going to start pushing. And just to demonstrate the winning idea, I cannot take this once again. He's going to go f5, bring the king, any move. It doesn't matter. I'm not even looking at the queen side. And then he's going to split and then grab all of them and then come back and then grab all of these. Not a problem, it's easy. And this would be game over. So I can't go c4. So what do I do? I go king c6. Okay, it's not so clear what I'm trying to do, but here my opponent goes a4. Well, he somewhat has to go a4 because my idea in this scenario is if I can get my king to b5 successfully, then I will go c4. And this time, if you go b4, my king can actually invade because the c pawn will be defending the b pawn. So if you kind of do whatever you want, I will just do this and um, try to create some counterplay, let's say. And if you play b4, I got c5. Oh, I don't have c5. I'll just go here and just win the pawn. And if you try to go for some central pawns, I will start running my pawn too because I also have my own uh, passer. But anyways, I played king c6. My opponent will not even allow me to get any counterplay. And here they played d3 because my idea was I wanted to go there and then go c4. 
to split off the pawn on a4 with the b3 pawn. But as soon as I attempted that, I was not allowed to even touch, uh, touch that pawn. So again, it's a tough moment, I would say, because I don't know how to even defend this position. And I guess I will give it as a task to, to the audience. What would you play here? How would you even try to make a draw? Or is this a draw or is it lost? So I don't know. I cannot reveal everything, but it's tough position. I can only tell you that. Um, it is black to play. Yeah, it's kind of tricky. Yeah, you can go c6 here, but he's not going to do anything, right? He's just going to bring his king. So if you go c6 or something, he's just going to bring his king. At least that's his idea. And then push the pawn, and then we have talked about this before. Anyways, I played d4. At least, you know, kind of keeping the pawn alive. He played f4. Very logical. I played g6. At least I want to keep his pawn there. I played king d4. He played king g3. So... I don't think I have to repeat the idea once again, but um, my opponent wants to go king g4, f5. So if I don't do anything, if I just wait with my king, king a5, king b4, he's going to go king g4, he's going to go f5, and then after I take, he's going to take, go there, take, and then bring his king slowly somewhere here, and then just take everything here, and then just promote all of the pawns. So it's very important moment now, moment of truth. What do we do? How do we even defend? How can we try to make a defense draw in this position? It's move number 36, but I still have quite a lot of time because I played the opening with full, full, full speed. So I had a lot of extra time um, and got into this position. Is the queen endgame after king c3, king d3, king e2 losing? Well, how do you even get a queen endgame? That's a problem because I don't think I promote at the same time. I think I am definitely short on tempo. So that is something uh, to, to evaluate. But everyone is suggesting king c3. You're saying we both promote. OK, let's see if you do. a5, you take. I push. Let's show me how you promote. Here. Here. You want to go king e2, sorry. King e2. OK, push. You sure about king e2? You're not gonna, you're not gonna be too happy about what you're going to see soon. You're not even threatening anything. You're not, you're not even threatening anything. That's the sad part. Even if you promote, I get, I mate you here. So, that's that's very funny, but that's kind of sad also. You're not even threatening to to promote, um, <laughs> and you're not at the same, you're not promoting at the same time. Definitely not. So it's very very important. Very important nuance. Um, but yeah, king c3, a5 takes there. Um, and okay, at least, um, yeah, so there is still more to calculate, unfortunately. And this is the reason I told in the beginning of the stream, this is the game that really makes me made me understand how I can calculate like a GM and actually how to play like a GM. Because as an IM, I, I was not sure what's the difference between an IM and GM. Like, I couldn't tell. I was like, why, why, what am I even missing? Why am I not a grandmaster yet? Um, but after this game, I was like, okay, these are the things I don't know. Because in a normal game, no one tells you. Actually, I calculated this line. King c3 takes king c2, d3, d2. And I was like, okay, this is it. It's a draw. He's going to give a check. I'm going to go here. And I'm going to promote next move. So with full confidence, I played the move king c3. And I was like, okay, this is a draw. But then what happens is we play all that. And then all of a sudden, I realize my opponent can give a check on e4. So it was a pawn end game that suddenly turned into a queen end game out of nowhere. And I wasn't expecting this because I was really expecting a handshake after basically second hour. And before even the time control, like, yeah, okay, we made the time control, it's already move 40, but somewhere around here I was expecting check, 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 draw, okay, let's go home, very nice. But I missed queen e4, completely. So that brings me to the point, and this is actually a, a prophylaxis lesson at the same time, 
In this position, the correct move was the move c6. That did not even cross my mind. But the idea is to prevent queen a8 to e4. And then it would be a, a draw. Let's say if my opponent played something like king g4, I would go here. Then we would do this, 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 all that. Same, same thing. Nothing different. Same thing. And that's why now he has to take the perpetual. Otherwise, I promote. And I'm actually going to probably win if you let me promote with a check. So that's why I had to play c6. And if I played c6, the game would have been over in actually no time. That would actually be over in no time. So let's say he played something like king f2, just to understand um, how this game would have ended in a draw. So let's say he goes here. I would have played something like h5. And then he can go f5, takes, takes, um, let's say king here, there. That would have been a blunder, but he has to push, of course. Takes, push, there, push, 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 push. And this would just end in a draw, right? And he has to give a perpetual. Um, there are many other lines, but for example, if I even continued wait, like if he did king f2, king a5, king f3, king b4, king a, so all of this, let's say, happens. Even if I'm like casually waiting, even if we go for this, this would just also be a draw. And this is the one I like the most because uh, this would just end with a bare king, you know. And this would actually be a nice way to end, end the game. So here I just played king c3, rushing it without even thinking. I was like, okay, it's easy draw, so let's just go for it. And then guess what happens? We just entered, as you guys said, round two. We're playing a queen end game all of a sudden. Sorry, well, I still don't understand. Why does c6 what does it prevent? It's prevents queen e4. When the oh, when when the pawn is here, you cannot jump there. That's the point. And then takes here. My opponent played queen there, centralizing the queen. And then I played queen c3, and my opponent played f5. And here I was a little frustrated because this is not what I expected. And I'm playing a 2600 grandmaster. It's, it's kind of uh, very difficult to like handle it because I was hoping this would have been a draw a long time ago. He plays f5, and here I'm like already looking for some cheap tricks. I give a check, really hoping for king h5, queen g5. Of course, it's not going to happen. And here, once again, I miss a very difficult draw, but it was more out of frustration. I wasn't even looking for the draw. I'll just show this for the sake of time, but here I played this, my opponent should, I mean, if I played queen d4, opponent has to go queen g4, because if they take the queen, if they push, or just, I'll just show you guys. If you take, I just take, and if you push, we promote at the same time, and this would also be a, be a draw. So after, um, after I go queen d4, he has to go queen here, and I wasn't looking for the draw, but the draw would have been something very forcing. I wasn't looking for it, so I couldn't find it. Although I saw this move and I thought, okay, this is also something, but I gave up the pawn for free and I couldn't like really understand how h5 even helps my position. Because even if I check him around, he's just going to run away. But the weird move here is that I go back to d4. So I just sacrifice the pawn, but I bring my queen back to d4. And even if you try to go away, I will check you. If you go to g5, I'll check you. If you go up, I check you. And if you go to h3, um, I can basically just check you around and then go back to d4 whenever needed. And this would, would also be a draw. And if you go here, I will just continue checking you until you're fed up and then you have to go to h4 and I go back to d4. So I missed this draw as well. So I just started playing and I got frustrated. I played c6 and then the game just went on and on. And this f pawn is just painful. It's just there and it's, it's just difficult to deal with. Um, I could never take it. My opponent didn't give it away. And I'm just defending, but my time is starting to tick down because now we made the time control, but I'm burning a lot more time because it's a queen end game. Not everything is easy to calculate. There are millions of checks, millions of captures and all that. And um, it's just getting tougher and tougher. I took this pawn on c4 and the uh, like complications in the middle of the game, but the f pawn is going down the board. The computer is always giving zeros in every single position. Um, 
but it's not easy for me to understand. I just don't have enough time. Uh, even if I have time, I cannot really evaluate. And I eventually just continued giving checks, hoping that my opponent would at some point, I don't know, blunder something or allow me to make a draw or something. And then here, anyways, I'm not commenting too much about this part of the game because there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, weird computer lines that probably we don't really want to talk too much about but the position has been going winning for white to drawing and back and forth a lot of times so the the tables have been turned multiple times but i don't want to stick to the details of things i just want to give the concepts of of this thing so anyway somehow his king made it to b7 and then this pawn is very close to promoting and it eventually did promote so i did blunder significantly at some point and he promoted and here my opponent took this and here i played c3 so this is the next critical moment so what have we seen so far we have seen extreme opening preparation and then the next thing we saw was um two rooks end game two rooks versus two rooks then we saw rook versus rook and then we saw a pawn end game. And after a pawn end game, we saw a queen end game. And after a queen end game, now we're witnessing a queen versus pawn. And these types of situations are tough because with the C pawn, you have to be extremely careful. There are a lot of drawing positions. If my pawn was here, if my king was there, and if this pawn was missing, it would have been a draw. But the question is, what is the evaluation of this position and how do you um how do you win this type of position with white or is it a draw or what is the eval so i guess i will ask the the chat what do you guys think about this position what what is the eval what is happening because the c pawn tends to be a draw quite a lot of times but is this one of the times but they also say that when there is an extra pawn this should always be winning because there is no stalemate right so so it's tricky um, should be winning for white. Yeah, it's, it's is it winning? How do you win? What's your move? You have to prove if it's a win, even conceptually. Um, yeah. You see it. With you win. Okay. How do you win? For me, it would be queen the a on the ladder up a the a b file. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but okay. Let's say queen b8, right? Let me go here. Sure. B6. Okay. Let's say. Let's say I go here. Okay. Queen a1. Uh -huh. Very good. Yeah. So you are trying to get the queen here. Okay. So let's say let's say I would not leave. Let's say I stay in front of my pawn. So I don't let you queen a1, right? Queen b4. Let's say I go here. King comes. Okay. Let's say I play. Queen B1, is it over? Queen B6. Well, the moment you bring the king, I push. Queen B2, okay, no problem. Here, yeah. Okay, I'll just move anywhere. It doesn't matter. Yeah, this is this is important. So let's say I go here. How do you make sure you don't stalemate, though? I think you already did. Yeah, I think it's like with the king here. It's already. So how? 
Uh, let's King see. E5. Well, you can't go there. I take there, right? So you mean here, King yeah. E5? Yeah. yeah, you can go there. I'll go C5. Trying to sack this pawn. And believe it or not, this is actually a draw, which is very surprising. You're initially right. The position is winning. Yeah, but I'll just show the nuances. So this position is winning for sure, 100%. I think the easiest way, the best way, which I always think about it is, you. and you're right, you want to get the queen there. Preferably, you want to get the queen here. I mean, that's kind of easier. And then it would just be winning. So I think the easiest way to win is just give a check, force my king here, and then play queen d4, which he saw in the game, by the way. We talked about this after the game. But he said he was concerned about the c5 push. Because, of course, if you take, but also notice, this is at the seventh hour of the game. This is not like we just started playing the game and he's super fresh. It's literally seven hours in. It's past 10, 8, 10 p.m. And he totally forget, forgot that he can play this move, queen e5, or anywhere on this diagonal. It doesn't matter. And this is completely winning. Because now, for me to be able to push this pawn, I need to move my king. And even if I move the king anywhere, now you bring your king. And after c2, you just play queen to a1 and that's it. It's always going to be lights out. And he thought that this is just easy win. He just played queen c5, and he was basically expecting a resignation. But already this move itself is a draw, and it's done. There is no way after this move queen c5, and it's so shocking because like after c2, he, he just couldn't believe his eyes. He still played on forever, but there is no way. After this weird position, it's just a draw. And... Um, yeah, okay, he tried. He brought his king, I brought my king, he gave some checks. He did everything what we all would do, right? If I go king a1, you take the pawn, there is no stalemate. King c1, king d6, king d2. Of course, I can't really do much. And then he just gives me some checks. And his idea is, just like we saw in the position, if you play king c5, this is a draw. Because I will go king there, and now you cannot take my pawn. It's a stalemate. Because you just put your king in front of my pawn. That's the only pawn that I would try to move. And this would be a stalemate. So that's why what my opponent did was, okay, he was like, I'll check you around, and then I'll bring my king on e5, just like it was suggested. King e5, and I will try to go from there. But now I go c5. And as you all probably might know, when you're giving these checks, you have to give a check from before, at some point, of before this square, but now you cannot do that. My pawn controls this square. So... Out of frustration, okay, he just plays on, gives a check, I go king c3, and now you don't even have a choice. You basically have to take this pawn. You can still check around, but it's not going to change anything. If you check here, I go king b2, you don't even have queen b4 check. So it's kind of upsetting. So he ended up taking this pawn, but now this is an easy draw. But here my opponent played queen e2. I still have to be careful, though, in this position. So what do you do with black? It's still King A1, yes. King A1 is very important so that if they take it, still mid. But why not King B1? King C4 wins. King C4 wins, exactly. And this. So I still had to be careful. And this is move 96. I'm like extremely tired, but my opponent is still like finding resource after resource to try to trick me into blundering something potentially. So I played King A1. And then he played queen d2, and then the game ended in a draw. But what's the, what's the drawing idea if he goes king c4? Here. It's quite simple, but I think it's quite nice. Why is king b1 not a draw? It is draw. Queen b1, king here. And then B1. here I would have just played this, just, oh. just for the beauty of things. But um, that's why I always ask it, because queen c1 is easy draw, but this is just a cuter draw. But in the game, after all that, we just played on, and at the end, he just took this pawn. And um, yeah, that, that, was a, that was a win. So um, the question in the chat is, can you show the one difference why the position was winning? Well, the, the reason why it was winning is I can't push my pawn to c2. So, if he, I mean, you can do any other technique, by the way. I just like this queen d1, queen d4, because 
I cannot get my pawn to c2. That's just my mindset. Um, queen c5 was the mistake because it allowed uh, c2, and then after that, it's just lights out. Because the thing is, the problem is this king. If the king is like somewhere on, like somewhere in front of this pawn, like on e4, or on even on h4, probably it's still winning. But with the king trying to come from behind, it would have to block the pawn or has to go around like from here to there, just like in the game. It did this and then did that because it couldn't block this pawn. So you had to go around it, which spent too much time. And the pawn on c5 actually guards critical moments. So allowing c2 was critical. But yeah, this game overall was um, 103 moves. It lasted more than seven hours, probably like seven hours, like 15 minutes. I was very exhausted and I actually lost the next round. But then at the end of the tournament, I actually got a GM norm. So I was very happy about it. And then the next tournament, I became a GM. But I really think that it was because of this game, because my opponent kept on finding resource after resource. And I wasn't calculating any of this in a game. Like I was just... Um, playing moves just to make moves and I was always wondering what is the difference between a GM and an IM or even anyone else and this game was a huge lesson for me like there is always a resource you have to defend you have to be active um, you have to calculate precisely and the nuances like uh, even the nuance in this position where I'll just go all the way back this was like multiple end games end game after end game when he played this move rook e4, I actually started figuring out, okay, this is actually tougher than I thought. And here I was expecting rook a4 and it will be an easy draw. And then my opponent goes rook h4. And then I somehow end up in a pawn end game. Like here I was expecting, okay, we're going to shake hands. He's going to go king g2. I'm going to give him a check. He's going to go to h file. I'll repeat, we're going to make a draw. No, none of that happened. He played rook a4. He sacked this pawn. We somehow ended up in a pawn end game. That pawn endgame turned into a queen endgame because of my blunder, because I wasn't thinking. If I was thinking, I would have found this move c6 here. I would not have had to play the queen endgame that I played in the game because I was just lazy and calculating and stuff like that. But yeah, that was the end of that game. Um, and this was one of the key moments. So I'll just leave it at that. And um, yeah, thank you all for watching. And I'll see you all in another lecture.